they you know they kept on spreading this story and they have done it in the past also that shyama prasad mukherjee was a member of the muslim league government in bengal no which is not true it was a fazlul haq government uh, and uh, of which shyama prasad mukherjee was a member and the day the government falls and the muslim league takes over shyama prasad mukherjee resigns from the government now why did he push for bengal's partition because sarath bos and the congress were quietly selling the idea that bengal should not be divided it should be left uh, um, as a whole entity but it would not be a part of india now with its muslim majority undivided bengal had a muslim majority a very clear muslim majority everybody knew what lay uh, what uh, what would be the fate of bengal an undivided bengal with a muslim majority would not be a uh, independent entity it would automatically become a part of pakistan now to preempt that shama prasad mukherjee and others they forced a vote and they ensured that bengal was divided and the hindu majority western part of it remained with india now but nobody will admit this nobody will tell this story our history books don't tell this story now essentially the congress's grudge against shama prasad mukherjee is that he defied nehru and challenged this extraordinary arrangement which nehru had devised along with sheik abdullah for jammu and kashmir article 370 a special status they would have their own flag they would have their own prime minister uh, he said what rubbish it is one country there has to be one constitution one flag and one prime minister and the very fact that someone should so so strongly oppose nehru was never forgiven why does shama prasad mukherjee resign from nehru's cabinet because nehru goes and signs a deal with liaquat ali khan which was a total sell out of minority interests in pakistan but nobody will ever talk about it now it is you know one can go on and on and on and you know where you where we began this uh, discussion about the colonial mind everybody keeps on talking about the fantastic speech which nehru gave on 15th august 1947 the trust with destiny speech and the, the i mean his masterly command over language his uh, um, great intellectual ability to grasp the real significance of the moment does anybody over here present today Uh, listening to us does anybody know what was the literacy rate or literacy level in india in 1947 in the 1941 census and then uh, you know it was some 12% so even if we adjust it for the 6 years which had uh, passed since then it would be around 14 between 14 and 15% 
that was the average literacy rate in India. And you have the first prime minister of the country, of independent India, addressing his people in accented English. And the Congress feels very proud about it. And this snigger at the current prime minister who addresses his people in Hindi at a time when literacy rate in India, if we again adjust for the intervening period, uh, intervening years, would be roughly around 80% today. So, you know, what are we talking about really? I mean, these are, uh, you can, one can keep on arguing that they are wrong, they are so grossly wrong, they are grotesquely wrong, they are perversely wrong, but it just doesn't make any difference to those who actually believe that we exist or we still, or, or this, or, or the uh, Republic of India came into existence because of one family. The whole notion of being beholden to any one individual or one family is repugnant. It's not only repug repugnant because we, we are a republic, but it is also repugnant because we are not um, uh, we are not a Westphalian state. We are not a country which came into existence accidentally or because of uh, 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 high politics in Vienna. We are a civilizational nation. We have been in existence. We had a particularly bad phase when first the invaders and then the Europeans, they came and colonized the country. We finally got rid of them and we emerged as an independent country. But that does not lessen or that does not minimize our identity, our heritage as a civilizational nation. And for a civilizational nation to be beholden to one individual, a group of individuals, or one party, it is totally, it's not only repugnant, but it's also obnoxious. But who's to tell them that? And that's, that's why, as Vikram said, that history became a tool in the hands of the state. And while it was claimed that history was, a, was used as a tool for nation building, that is just not true. History was used as a tool to sort of build up one party, build up one family, and build up a situation where the entire country, to the last man, woman, and child, would feel beholden to this one individual, one family, and one party. <laughs> 